Our guest in this segment is past his 30th birthday as well, Financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors, Winchester Avenue, Martinsburg. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, Rob. How are you guys? We are well, Phil, and yourself. I am living the dream. Phil, we had the uh, first preseason game Friday night for the Steelers. We did. I know you don't put a lot of Best stock in the preseason, the nor do I, but it's always good to watch some football. It is. And, yeah, you, I like to watch some of the, the younger players or the newer players. I was impressed with Frazier from uh, WVU and – the um, and and some of the receivers actually that they picked up not quite not uh, Watkins but some of the receivers that they had picked up I have high hopes for this season sir. Hey, two Mountaineers could have a very big impact on the Steelers this year: Zach yeah. Frazier at center and Beanie Bishop in the secondary. Undrafted, yeah, and he it looks like he may start the season off because of someone being suspended. But uh, Frazier and Beanie Bishop, uh, they were on the field most of the time. And as I understand, if the season started today, both of those guys would make the starting lineup. So that, that's, um, that's impressive. I think they see Beanie as uh, someone guarding uh, uh, slot receivers. And uh, he got a chance to blitz, almost got a sack on Friday night, too. He uh, did early in the game, yep. Yeah. Uh, on to uh, money, Phil. Uh, we have a couple of key reports coming out this week, Tuesday and Wednesday. Shall we discuss? Oh, yes. And let's go back to the last week and, and the pivot that we've taken. Because I, I missed last week. I did get to hear a large part of uh, John's segment as I was leaving the dentist. But there's been a huge pivot. And we've been talking about this for years where good news is bad news and bad news is good news. And the very second that we got um, a, a unemployment report that shocked us to the bad news side, we immediately – started talking about recession and we we knew that was going to happen that we our our focus would go from inflation give us some bad news so the federal reserve can cut rates and then when we get that bad news then we somewhat panicked it somewhat may be an understatement we panicked last monday and that it's almost like the dog that finally caught the car what are you going to do when you get there well we got that information and immediately now we want to see good news immediately and now with all the volatility that we had last week, the week ended up, although we're, we've been on a string of losing weeks, it wasn't all that bad. If you just look from the open on Monday to the close on Friday, it seemed like a kind of a ho-hum week if you just look from start to finish, but it was anything but every day was volatile. Those wild swings uh, to the good and to the bad, of course. And then as we head into this week, we had the in, – in, in, Mr. Stubblefield has, has coined this alphabet soup of reports with the PPI coming first and then the CPI on Wednesday, and the CPI would get the most attention. And then Thursday, even though it's a weekly jobs report, I think Thursday's report is going to be uh, maybe more important than the CPI. And this has been the first time we've heard that for a while. We have to remember what the Federal Reserve mandates are, and one is inflation and the other is an employment in the employment, uh, the unemployment number that went up to 4.3 shocked us a little bit last week. Uh, uh, Bill? Yeah. I almost uh, called you Phil. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't call me Phil on this because Phil's the expert. Uh, Phil, the, the feds, uh, Jerome Powell, uh, has kind of been on the sidelines for the last several months. Uh, and has that been a good thing? And do you anticipate the feds to be kind of taking a more passive role role in the future or how do you see that playing out i don't know that i would describe them as being on the sidelines but they 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 do their he does i shouldn't say they but he does his best when he speaks not to sway our markets one way or the other and try to be uh, put it on the data and just kind of be very unemotional and tell us what they see what they think and what the potential outcomes could be but, yeah, I think the Federal Reserve is going to catch a ton of attention, uh, especially leading up to the election, because now they're to the point they knew this was coming, so it's not going to be a shock. But no matter what they do, it's going to be viewed as political uh, heading into September and, and then November. So whether they – and it's almost a certainty that they're going to cut rates anyway. It would be a shock if they didn't. Uh, now the question is, do they do uh, 50 basis points or just 25 
but I think they, the Federal Reserve will get the attention that kind of we've been giving them on this show. You know, I talk about them every single time I come on here, and I'm sure it's a tired story. And then, of course, we all we, we debate whether or not they've done a good job or a bad job or what we think of them. But in the like you said, in the national limelight, they're not talked about as much. But now I think they will play a key role here in the next few months. With we'll judge what they've done in the past and then predict what they should do in the future. And there'll be criticisms and supports, of course, coming both ways. But the Federal Reserve as a whole and on the political side, you know, will they get replaced if the Republicans win and do they maintain their position? So all of this is going to come into play and they will be a focus uh, moving forward. They should have been a focus in the past, but I, I do get it gets to be a tired story because we've been talking about those guys for uh, on I have anyway for the last two years. J.P. Morgan has raised the odds of recession for 2024 to 35%. On Squawk Box, investor David Roche said that we will have a bear market in 2025, a loss of at least 20%. Uh, he said the uh, Fed's slow, slow and not enough rate cuts, uh, profits won't fulfill expectations, and the AI bubble. These are the reasons he cites for a bear market in 25, Phil. But if I, before, yeah. before you go, Phil, let me pick up on that because uh, Rob is raising the point that I was kind of hinting at, but then Roach went on to say the Fed will step in before it turns draconian. So both of those together. Yeah, and I think that's where like some of the support, even if you think they've waited too long, and a lot of people do. I know Rob does. They, he thinks that they've waited too long to begin to cut rates, but that is an easier repair than cutting rates too soon. So they, they have the ability to um, cut rates, even if it's by 50 basis points. That might give us a little shock to say, hey, what do they know that we don't? Uh, it, could, it could increase the, the fear of a recession. And I would, I would maintain, I, it looks to me, you know, I think the odds are that we have a soft landing, which doesn't happen very often. Let's get that out there. It doesn't happen a whole heck of a lot where they can accomplish a soft landing. But even if we go into a recession, to Bill's point, uh, even if we go into a recession, if it's a short-lived recession, then I would still consider it a win. It wouldn't be a blowout win if we got a soft landing, but a short-lived recession, I think given what COVID brought and every all the unknowns that COVID brought with it, and make no mistake, we're still in COVID markets. COVID may be gone from you know the shutdowns and so forth all the economic struggles from it may be gone but we're dealing with that water damage that mitch mcconnell we brought up in april of 2020 he's always said you don't worry about the water water damage when your house is on fire we're still dealing with some of the water damage from COVID, and if they could do that with a very mild short-lived recession or no recession at all i would consider that a win but there's going to be varying opinions on both sides of that equation where uh, you, you hear people criticize how long they took to uh, decrease rates and they've waited too long. And you'll hear a lot of, of, of complaints about they waited too long to increase rates, which they did. Uh, and they admittedly so they did. But they waited too long to increase rates. And now they think, well, now you're waiting too long to decrease rates. And it's just a debate. But the proof will be in the pudding when this is all said and done. It feels sometimes like we're trying to drive down a mountain, curvy mountain road with a steering wheel that that responds 10 seconds after you turn it, you know? So the, the Fed is making all these changes. They're talking about making these changes and they're, they're responding to what they see in the markets or not responding as the case may be. And then there's, there's the ripple effect, right? There's the response. They make a change, then there's, there, there's a response and they make another change. What is the delay? I mean, it seems, aren't we always working in arrears here? Yes, yes because any move that they make takes three to six months to work its way through the economy. So in order for them to, and that's why a lot of people think that they're late, but in, in, when they say, and now we see it in our markets immediately, right, because our markets are predictive. We're, we're going based off not necessarily what's happening today, but what we perceive is going to happen in, in the future. But with the Federal Reserve, they know that when they make a move on interest rates, that takes a while to make its way through the economy. However, cutting rates makes its way quicker through than increasing rates makes its way through. So that is a little bit quicker. But, yes, they're reading the data, 
and they're saying, hey, we're going to predict. We're predicting what could happen. And if they're wrong, then, they, yeah, it could be damaging. But if they're correct, that's where we accomplish the soft landing. But that's a good analogy because it is. It, it is all predicted. Now, they're going to read current data, but predict based off of trends. And that's why they didn't cut the last meeting. There's been – there's been a lot of pushback because they didn't already begin to cut. But they need to see trends. They need to see more than one report in order to encourage them to make a move. Now, the report that they saw that really kind of jolted them was that unemployment number. And in a vacuum, that unemployment number wasn't terrible. But if you start to look at the trend where it was 3.6 and it was 3.7, it was uh, 3.9, and then, ooh, 4.3, and there was a big jump, and that trend w w is sharp. So that's where some of the fear came in last week and then kind of eased us a little bit, the jobless claims on last Thursday, kind of uh, quelled those a little bit. But we do want to – they want to see trends before they start to make cuts, and we have to remember this because even if, if the, what they do is damaging to the markets, they shouldn't care. I'm not saying that they don't, but they shouldn't care what it does to the markets because their mandates are inflation – and employment numbers. Those are their mandates, and that's the tightrope that they're trying to walk. So while they're slowing inflation, they're knowingly increasing unemployment numbers. They know that they're doing that, and now we're starting to see the impact of all of those rate increases on the employment side. We've seen inflation slowly come down, but the employment numbers that jumped up last week, that was the proof that was in the pudding that would encourage the Federal Reserve to cut rates, and some speculate that they may do uh, 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 50 basis points instead of just a small quarter of a percent. And even a few have said at Jackson Hole on, I think it's August the 22nd, uh, Jackson Hole, that they may even introduce a rate cut then. And I think that's possible based off of what the unemployment numbers look like leading up to that. Ben, <clears throat> do they keep an eye? Last week um, when John was on, I think it was last week, um, the Wall Street Journal talked about the article in the journal that um, John Deere, had cut way back on their production numbers and that the, I think it was Whirlpool, I shouldn't say that if I'm not sure, but one of the, the big uh, appliance manufacturers is cutting way back because their orders are down. That Those are literally predictive because they're, they're just not getting the, these new orders. And we're seeing the unemployment numbers that are also going up, right, or employment numbers coming down. So... It seems to me, of course, I, I tend to go pessimistic on these things, as you know, but it just seems to me that the the economic numbers are the the predictive nature is is kind of dark, and that they're just being very slow on the draw here. Thank you, Mister Gilstrap. Yeah. I concur. I blame yeah, that on Jerome Powell myself, but go ahead, Phil. <laughs> But you guys are probably part of the half that thinks that they, they have been too slow. But from their standpoint, yes, as we're looking at it in a vacuum and then on a predictive standpoint, we still have to look at the other side of that equation, which is inflation. And, John, and I agree with you 100 percent. Why does it have to be 2 percent? We could be in a normalized economy at 2.5 percent or even a little bit higher. Why does it have to be that 2 percent? But if their goal is to get it down – to two percent and we're not quite there and predictably wise yeah it's, it's on its way but it's nowhere near there and that's a tightrope that they're trying to walk which is worse inflation that, that starts to cr creep its way back up or unemployment numbers that still in a vacuum aren't all that bad and could go a little bit further before it's a, an emergency situation and that's the tightrope that they're trying to walk they're still battling inflation all the while trying to keep employment numbers uh, in, in a in a respectable or in a in an acceptable position, that's the battle that they have. So I, my assumption is the reason they haven't cut rates yet is because their fear of inflation starting to kick back up. Yeah, uh, going. Let's. I know you do not like to get involved in politics at all, uh, and for very good reason. But the Biden administration has just recently unveiled unveiled a new multi agency regulatory effort to target corporate practices. Uh, why the timing on this, uh, Phil? I would think that they that's, want, that's going to have an impact on the market, I would believe, and I'm curious what the timing is. Yeah, it, to, to me, and, I, and, and I, I don't want to say this, but I will, it seems political. 
uh, to me, you know, le- leading up to this election. And we know that the the majority, I guess, of voters uh, are kind of against corporate or what they refer to as corporate greed. And I refer to it as corporate profit. And that may not be a popular statement, but we have to keep in mind that the uh, and, and I say this and there's someone on Facebook that we respectfully debate all the time. He, he respects my opinion. I respect his opinion immensely. But at the end of the day, these companies are the ones that are paying us or paying the employees, and they do need to make profit. And any time you introduce regulation into uh, the corporate world, it hurts. It hurts uh, the potential for profit. So the less regulation, the more. And that's why a lot of people think, like, well, it's a better corporate environment if Republicans are in because they have less regulation. And, and I understand the need for some regulation. I'm not saying that there doesn't need to be. But just like you said, the timing of this in uh, three months before the election and now, hey, let's battle inflation by this way. Let's battle inflation by controlling corporate profit. But as we've seen before, you know, they have to make money or they won't exist. And if they don't exist, they don't provide jobs and they don't provide goods and services and they don't provide health benefits. So if that begins to happen, then we've got another problem on the unemployment front. But to me, the timing of it, if you if you were going to do something like that, it should have been done a couple of years ago, not three months before the election. If and look, not when inflation was almost tanked. If you're looking for a, a bright spot in the volatility of this stock market and how I guess the indices have come down some, this would be a great time to convert your traditional IRA or 401k to a Roth, Phil, wouldn't it? Well, it would be, and it just depends on, again, the, t- the time frame that you're looking at because we have had recent volatility, and especially on the side of the NASDAQ, so growth companies or large growth companies have struggled some. But when you look at the overall market from the beginning of the year, it's still been a pretty good year. But, uh, you know, we're up, I think, 12.5% on the S&P uh, up until this point, and, and I'll take it. If someone said to me right now, some people may get mad at me if I did it, but if they said, hey, Phil, you can lock in these gains that you've had for 2024 that the markets have had for 2024 and we'll finish 2024 exactly where we are today i'd probably take it because that being said it has been a pretty good year depending on how you've been invested but if you've been well diversified it's been a pretty decent year it hasn't been one for the record books because of the last month or so but it it still has been a pretty good year but for but by way of converting roth and so forth yes if you're going to do it You should do it after a pullback in the markets. But here's the key component. In order to get money from a tax qualified or a taxable account or a traditional IRA over to a Roth, those assets must be sold, right? So that's one part of it. I'm going to sell it low, and that sounds like the reverse of what we think. But when that money goes from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, or even if you're doing an in-plane conversion uh, with your 401K, once it gets over to that Roth side, You must buy those assets back or you didn't do yourself any favors. So you must buy those assets back. And that's the second leg of this that some people miss out on. You know, we had a, we did a lot of conversions in 2020, a lot of conversions because it was a good time for it. Uh, Values were down. Let's go ahead and pay taxes on it while the values are down. Move it over to the, to, to the tax free growth side of things. But the second part of it is, and that was hard to convince people. Hey, let's sell it now while we're afraid. But in order to complete this and for this timing thing that we're doing with this Roth conversion to be successful, we have to buy those assets back. And that's where some of the reluctance was, was, well, I'm, I want to move it over to the Roth and leave it as cash for a little bit. Well, you're not really taking advantage of a fallen market if you do that. The only way to, to, to fully take advantage of it is if you buy those exact assets back. Second part of that is key, Phil. Otherwise, you're sitting in cash. Yes. Second part of it is is the key to it. If you want to take advantage of the fallen market and do a conversion, we're big, big fans of conversions. Everybody knows that. But if you're going to sell it, and that is a, a component of it, you have to sell that asset. So if I'm selling a large growth mutual fund inside of my traditional and moving that cash over to a Roth conversion, man, i got to buy that large growth mutual fund, but i got to buy something back, but preferably the same thing that you sold. For the next three or four months, do you foresee a bear market or a uh, a bull market or just more or less static? I see what we saw last week, and I could be wrong with that, but I see uh, overreactions on both sides of the equation. I think September and then, of course, how we behave 
through the election. I don't believe in the long term that the, the markets are dependent upon a Democrat or a Republican winning. I really don't. I think the markets will perform just fine under either one of them. They'll have to adjust based off of who wins. Companies will have to adjust. But at the end of the day, I do think there's going to be wild swings based off of employment data, whereas in the past, our wild swings, that's what I was alluding to earlier, in the past, we had wild swings based off of CPI and PPI, but now I think the majority of the focus is going to be on the employment market because our fear is recession, and that employment market will be one thing that could stoke that fear. Phil, do you see the platforms of either party driving the market one way or the other? Uh, I, I do with taxes, and you know we we know that we got those the the tax cuts of 2017, and on that, as far as the markets are concerned, the corporate tax rate uh, it, it was a huge component. That cut in the corporate tax rate was a huge component of our stock markets going up. And I'm going to say this because I know that there's a lot of people that's like, oh, cut corporate taxes, oh, boo. But at the end of the day, you know, when when they say they're to beholden to their stockholders, we hear that all the time. These companies are beholden to their stockholders. Well, let's look at who the stockholders are because it's not the monopoly man. The stockholders are pensioners. The stockholders are mom and pops that have saved their entire lives and they're living off their 401ks. It's not billionaires and trillionaires. The people that rely on stock market performance are those that have skimmed pennies their entire life so they can retire at a decent age, and they are dependent upon the stock market's performance. It doesn't have to be 40% every year, but they're dependent upon company profits and stock market performance to sustain them, especially during times of inflation, so they can still live a respectable life and not have to go back to work or work part-time or push retirement off from age 67 to 70 or whatever it may be. Those are the stockholders that they're beholden to, and I've got no problem with it. Now, yes, you, you need to, to make a livable wage and, and so forth, and, and especially in cases of pharmaceuticals and you know, life-saving medications. Yeah, there should be a lot of regulation so there's not price gouging. But being a capitalist, that unforgiving capitalist that I am, you know, if, if a company is selling something and you don't like the price that they're selling it for or you don't like the pro profit margin that they're making, it's all public. You can find it. If you don't like that, then don't participate. Participate with somebody else. And But in this case, you know, corporate profits and, and them playing to their stockholders isn't a bad thing. Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Catch Phil each weekday morning at 638 for two minutes on the market. This is Talk Radio WRNR Martinsburg.